So while we are here this week uh, figuring out what it means to be resurrection people and then next Sunday we'll be celebrating our college students, I want to go ahead and put in your mind something that we'll be doing during the month of May. Uh, during the four weeks of May uh, here in worship, we're, we're going to be working our way through the book of James. And so if you're not here next week, I just wanted to go ahead and give you a heads up that um, our sermon series for May is going to be exploring the book of James and what it means for us to, to live out our faith through the works that we can produce on behalf of God. Now, this morning, today's message isn't so much a sermon as it is a question. What's next? After the excitement of Easter has faded away and we've come down from our spiritual high, what's next? What are we supposed to do? Who are we supposed to be in light of the resurrection? Now, that's a question people of faith have been asking for 2,000 years, and it's a question we continue to ask today. Now, for better or worse, I don't think there's a single answer to this question, and really, nor do I think there should be. Because when you think about it, how can you sum up the power of the resurrection in a statement? You can't. Instead, we're called to show the power of the resurrection through the way we live our lives. While the good news of the resurrection should be pondered in our hearts and considered in our minds, it's not supposed to be hidden inside of ourselves. It's meant to be celebrated, shared, and seen through our lives. Since Easter morning, it's fallen to normal people like you and me to be transformed by the resurrection, to live our lives as resurrection people, and to share the good news of the risen Christ with the entire world. As we talked about last week, the resurrection story and what it means for people like us, that's considered good news. And the world we live in today desperately needs to hear some good news. And through the way we live our lives as resurrection people, we can share that good news with others. And those others that we're called to reach with his love, they're not people without faces and names. They're people whose names you know. They're people whose faces you see day in and day out. It's the people in your neighborhoods, in your classes, in your workplaces, and even in your homes. And for better or worse, friends, you're the person God's placed in their life to show them that there's more to this life than sin and death. You're the person God's chosen to break into their lives with the good news of Easter and to show them how the resurrection's transforming you day in and day out. Now, I'll be honest. It's equal parts humbling and frightening to know that God's entrusted you you, of all people, was sharing the good news of the gospel. And when you actually stop and consider that our Lord sees you as worthy for such a task, it should leave you like the, woman, like the women who found the tomb empty on Easter morning, afraid, yet filled with joy. Now, most of the time, when people stop and consider their role as resurrection people, they typically have one of two responses. One is that they either try to become super Christians who know everything there is to know about the Bible, their faith, and how to share it, or they stop to consider and see, see themselves as not up to this task. They think there's some impossible standard that they have to meet in order to share God's love, and so they just decline to show it, share it, or even live it out through their lives. It's too hard to do, so they just give up. Chances are, you know somebody who falls into either of these two categories. And, if we're being honest, you might identify with one of those yourselves. But here's the thing. I don't believe that Christ expects us as Christians to become holy rollers for him. Nor do I think that, nor does he want us to be worried about meeting some sort of impossible standard and begin feeling dejected about our prospects. Deep down, I truly believe that Christ wants us to live simple, humble lives through which we can show and share God's love 
in a way that doesn't feel forced or fake. Now, the worst thing we can do to accomplish this goal is to make things complicated. And friends, we make things complicated all the time, don't we? But here's the thing. We can't make things complicated or think that we're not good enough to be used by God. If anything, the power of the resurrection proves that you are, in fact, as flawed, as imperfect, and imperfect as you may be. That you are worthy to be used by God to show and share his love to others. After all, if Christ saw you as worthy enough to live, die, and rise again for it, you're certainly worthy enough to show and share his love with others. So, since you're worthy, since you're called, and since you're equipped by God to share his love, I think we need to take some time to talk about, some time today to talk about how we can do just that. How we can show and share God's love and live out our role as resurrection people. And we're going to do so today by by looking at some of the encounters that the risen Christ had with his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And now through each of these encounters, excuse me, we're we're left with a lesson that we can use to better show and share the love of Christ. And really, these lessons aren't all that complicated. We just got to go fishing, feed the sheep, and tell the story. So for our first lesson today, it's Go fishing. And it comes from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. And you might want to go ahead and find your way to that chapter if you have your Bible with you. If not, we'll hit it right here on the screen in just a moment. Now, by the time we reach this point in the resurrection story, uh, the risen Christ has met with his disciples twice already. And as they continue to, to figure out what the resurrection means for them, as they continue to ponder that question of what's next... A couple of them decide to go get something to eat. They get in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, push off from shore, and they go fishing. Among them are Peter and Thomas, two disciples who were fishermen by trade. And it was in a setting just like this that Jesus had found them years prior and called them out to become his disciples. And it's on the Sea of Galilee where we pick up this story in verse 1. So afterward... Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Sounds like a lot of fishing stories, right? Early in the morning... Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 to be exact, but even with so many, the net wasn't torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. And he did the same thing with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, you might be asking yourself, what's the lesson here? What can we learn about showing and sharing our faith from a story about fish? Well, quite a lot, actually. See, fishing takes a lot of preparation and patience. 
The idea behind fishing, after all, is to know the type of fish that you're trying to catch. Because not all fish are the same. Nor do they live in the same places or respond to the same bait. To catch your fish, you've got to learn about them. You've got to adapt your techniques in order to be successful. And above all else, you have to be patient. Fishing is not a sport or a hobby that produces immediate results. Sometimes, you just got to wait it out. Now, the preparation and patience it takes to go fishing, it really does tell us something about what it means to fish for people. See, like fishermen, like these disciples, each one of us is trying to catch different types of fish. And that's because chances are the people you share life with No one else in this room shares life with them like you do. It's a totally unique person group for who you are. And because of that, you've got to spend time learning about the people that God has placed in your path to love and reach. And when you think about those people in your life, you have to be honest and ask yourself, how much do I really know about them? Sure, you might know the basics like where they're from, you know, what music they like, or what favorite sports team they pull for. But y'all, that's surface level stuff. I mean, you can't catch fish by simply knowing they like water. You've got to know more. You know, when missionaries enter the field, they don't begin by going to some street corner and shouting out, God loves you. What do they do? They begin by building real and authentic relationships with people. If we want to learn more about the people that we're called to reach, we have to invite them into our lives. We have to be real and honest with them so that they can be real and honest with us. And along the way, a meaningful relationship can form One through which we can learn about our friends and how best we can reach them with the love of Christ. Much like fishing, though, building relationships takes time. And if you think you're going to change somebody's life in the span of a couple of weeks, you're setting yourself up for failure. Instead, be patient. Let your relationships grow and develop naturally. As we talked about earlier, People aren't looking for relationships that are forced or fake. The people that God's placed in your path, they deserve a real relationship with you. So give it to them. Let your relationships serve as the foundation for how you can show and share God's love to them. So prepare, be patient, and go fishing for the people that God's called you to reach. So if going fishing is how we prepare to show God's love, then our second lesson today, feeding the sheep, that's our first step in actually showing that love to others in a way that really hits them where they live. And how we go about showing that love, it doesn't have to be complicated or convoluted. It's just got to be done in a way that actually helps that person. That is a lesson that Christ passed on to Peter following this miraculous catch of fish. And let's hear their conversation as found in John 21, uh, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? (laughs) Well, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. What's important to note here about this conversation is that just days earlier, 
Peter had denied Jesus three times as Christ was being arrested, tried, beaten, and crucified. Now, risen and alive, Jesus begins this conversation by asking Peter if he still loves him. Obviously, it's a question that hurts Peter because until those moments of denial just days earlier, Peter had been Jesus' rock. He'd been the most dependable disciple. Now, Peter was in a position where he was going to have to prove his love and commitment to Christ. So how did Jesus propose that Peter prove such a love? By feeding the sheep. And no, Jesus didn't have some secret farm he was asking Peter to go and manage. Instead, Christ was calling Peter to prove his love by caring for people like Jesus had. Sometimes when we make things too complicated, we forget that in order to share our faith with others, to love others like we need to, we simply just have to love them like Christ loves us. Most of the time, it's just that simple. Throughout the gospel witness, Christ loved all types of different people and, and all sorts of different ways. You know, when Jesus was at a wedding feast, he celebrated with the people at the party. When he came, apro- came across people who were mourning the death of friends and loved ones, he mourned and cried with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. When someone was hungry, Christ fed them. See, Jesus embraced the excluded. He walked alongside those who suffered. And even now, in this moment with Peter, he showed his love by forgiving someone who did him wrong. In each of these cases, Christ showed his love to people in a real and tangible way. When we focus on the people that God's called us to reach, our first attempt at loving them, it doesn't need to be in some abstract spiritual way. It needs to be in a way that others can see, feel, and understand. As Christians, it's important to know the people we're called to love. But just as important, we have to know how to love them in a way that really makes a difference in their life. I mean, after all, you can't just see a friend who's suffering and say, hey, I'm praying for you. Is that what Christ would have done? Christ would have come along these people who are suffering to share in their burdens, to stand with them in the suffering, and to let them know that they are not alone. When Jesus told Peter to feed the sheep, he was telling Peter to give the people what they lacked and what they needed the most. If they were hungry for food, give them something to eat. If they didn't have clothes, give them something to wear. If they were neglected and persecuted, embrace and defend them. Christ has entrusted us. Christ has entrusted you to feed his sheep. How can you show the love of Jesus to the people in your life? So far, we've seen the importance of going fishing and of feeding the sheep. But if there's one lesson the resurrected Lord wanted to drive home, it's this. Tell the story. The last time Jesus was with his disciples, he gave them this great commission as found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We go fishing to find the people that we're called to reach for Christ. We feed the sheep by loving these people like Christ loves us. And after we've built up a relationship with them, it falls to us to tell the story. And in case you're wondering what story that is, it's the story of salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. It's the story of Jesus and his love for us. This great commission that we hear so much about, 
It's just Christ reminding his disciples and us one more time to make sure that we that to make sure people hear the good news through them. But don't be fooled. This commission given to a couple of guys on top of a mountain, it wasn't just for the disciples. It's for us too. Whether you realize it or not, you have been commissioned by God to tell of his amazing and eternal love. Oftentimes, we think that our actions are enough to satisfy this commission. And while our faith should and must produce good works, a faith that doesn't share and teach others about God's love, that isn't much of a faith at all. Eventually, we all reach a moment where we're called to be open and honest with others about our faith. And hopefully, through such honesty with people that we've built relationships with, we'll be able to share more about God's love. And through such earnest and honest efforts, it's our hope and prayer that our friends would believe, and like us, experience the power of the resurrection in their own lives. As we ponder what it means to live as resurrection people, we must remember that the resurrected Christ has commissioned us to tell his story. He, he's called us to proclaim the good news that death has been defeated and that love has won forever. And to do that, we don't have to know everything there is to know about the Bible, theology, faith, or anything else. After all, we're not scholars sharing a scientific discovery. We're sinners pointing the way to salvation. So as you find the best way to share this good news with your friends, never forget to speak this truth in love. Remember that these words we're called to share, they're not words of condemnation, they're words of freedom. And for us who take a leap of faith to share this story, we're in no position to condemn or judge, or judge others. Instead, we're in a perfect position to tell others what it's like to be forgiven and loved by the Savior that we're telling them about. But here's the thing. Don't be discouraged when the people you share your life and your faith with choose not to believe in Jesus. See, God's given each one of us free will, and because of that, each individual chooses for themselves what they'll believe or not believe. So while we can't force people to believe in Christ, we can sure continue to show and share God's love to them regardless of what they believe. After all, who knows? Maybe these people we share our faith with, maybe they'll never believe in Jesus. And if they don't, God doesn't fault you for that. But here's the thing. If we keep loving and caring for them in spite of what they believe or not believe, if we keep loving them as Christ loves us, who knows? There may be an opportunity down the road in days, weeks, months, or years in which they'll be more receptive to what we have to share. They'll be more longing for truth, purpose, and understanding. And then we can be there to them, for them to continue this conversation and to share the amazing love of Jesus. All we can do about that is just hope and pray and act when we're presented with the right opportunity. After Jesus gave this commission to his disciples, he went back up into heaven. And as he did so, he left people like you and me in charge of going fishing, feeding the sheep, and telling the story. And while Easter, the holiday, is already over, the good news of the resurrection remains. Christ is risen and death is defeated. So as resurrection people, I hope we'll become more committed to showing and sharing the love of Christ with others. Because all we have to do is go fishing, feed the sheep, and tell the story. Would you pray with me?